you know, I have a, a Garmin watch mm -hmm. and it constantly tells me to stop. Don't train hard. Don't yeah. just relax. <laughs> just take literally, it literally <laughs> tells me to like relax and yeah. go breathe or go, you know, do whatever. So like, I'm thinking about getting rid of this watch. Garmin. There's gotta be like a setting in this thing to stop making me th like feel bad for working yeah. hard. I'm Adam Brenneman. This, 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 this is Next Up. Appreciate you doing this, man. Thanks for uh, taking some time during during Super Bowl week. Excited to talk to you, Joe Conley, head sports performance coach, Arizona State. Do you have a assistant AD title too? I do not. No, uh, head coach for sports performance. That's right. For football. Yeah, that's right. Um, some some people have the AD title. It means some nothing. schools yeah. have it. <laughs> Ultimately, it's just a title. Yeah, I always lose track of your titles, man. You got so many of them. Master of strength, strength and conditioning, too, right? Yeah, a, a certified master yeah. of strength and conditioning, which is also um, it's a prestigious award, but ultimately it just means that I've been doing this for a little little while, yeah. um, and that uh, I guess that was last year in May that I finally met the criteria to yeah. to get that sort of certification, which is great. I mean, it's uh, being a young strength coach and, and sort of growing up in the, in the CSCCA and that organization, going to those conferences and those events and seeing all the kind of OGs of strength and conditioning and trying to learn from them. And then finally being standing on that stage in the event and yeah. getting, you get a jacket, you know, yeah. it's, it's a bigger, it's a little bit it's cheesy. Social media. Yeah. It. It's it a little bit cheesy, but it, yeah. it's, it, it ultimately, it, it does, you know, it's, I did it for a reason, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. Well, I'm excited to get you on. I've been wanting to do this for a while because you're one of the best strength coaches in college football. You have tons of knowledge for people. Also, you've been a huge part of my life. Like you were my strength coach at UMass. Um, and then I was with you at Arizona State and you've been just huge for me and my development on and like on the field and as a, as a man off the field. Um, so excited to talk to you and excited to, for you to kind of give all the things that you've taught me and taught your, your athletes, like give it to everyday people. Cause that's, who's going to be watching this podcast. Um, so again, thank you and appreciate everything you've done for me. Um, take me through your kind of journey to get to this point today as one of the, one of the best strength coaches in college football. Um, like we just talked about and uh, you know, running performance at a, at a power five school. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate, you know, everything you said and, and um you and me have always had a a really good relationship. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, we, we kept that going afterwards, which yeah. I, I always love to do with not only former athletes, but just people in general um, for the long term. But for me, you know, I've, I've been doing this since pretty much my master's program, which was in 2005, end of 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and started at Harvard University, you know, cutting my teeth, training 42 different teams. I and mean, we had three strength coaches in 42 varsity sports, mm -hmm. um, one weight room. And everybody in every one of those 42 teams, they all trained with us. They all had a slot of time, super busy. You know, I wasn't making any money. <laughs> I was bartending at night. Um, and I was commuting an hour each way. Um, <laughs> you know, living with my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. And um, that was a great experience for me to learn to coach on my feet, utilize my skill set in the moment. Um, but most importantly, coaching in general, like the thing I see most from younger coaches that are just coming out of college is that they may have the practical knowledge, mm. but they don't have the application they don't have the coaching yeah. experience the cues on the floor and the interaction with the athletes and they don't really know they may know what they want the lift to look like or what they want out of the lift but they don't know how to coach the athlete to actually execute it correctly mm -hmm. um and that's one thing that i certainly learned through my master's program and then at harvard um it was you know it was a great experience i went to university of louisville um after harvard where I was there for about a year. 
great experience, worked under, you know, famous strength coach Joe Ken, uh, who was previously at Arizona State. And, you know, I learned a ton from him and the staff we had. Then I went to South Carolina uh, initially as a, an assistant for three years with Craig Fitzgerald, who's the head straight coach for the New York Giants. Fitz, yeah. your guy, you know yeah. Fitz well. Yeah. Plenty of I'm stories saying, about yeah. Fitz. He was on my case a lot. Of you course. You guys both have always been. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> of course. You know, yeah. it's ultimately probably your fault more than any, <laughs> more than ours. But um, True. it is what it is. I deserve it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so I was with him for three years as an assistant. And then when he took the job at Penn State, mm-hmm. Coach Spurrier hired me as the director. So I was there for four years as director. Had really successful seasons. Two of the best, I think historically, the two best seasons in South Carolina football history, um, which was awesome. You know, we were able to go to the SEC championship game, you know, play Cam Newton, which was wild. We played them twice that year, actually. They beat us both times. Those were, our, I think, our only two losses on the yeah. year. But I had a lot of success there. What year was this at South Carolina? So I took over. So let me think. So I was there 9, 10. I took over, like, right at the transition from 11 to 12. Yeah. Um, and then was there 12, 13, 14, 15. And then Coach Spurrier uh, retired in 2015. Mm-hmm. And that's ultimately when I ended up at, at UMass, yeah. Yeah. Um, which was, you know, we, we talk a lot about this, but like yeah. going back home and being at UMass, having a sense of pride for mm-hmm. where you were. Not that I didn't have a sense of pride at South Carolina, but it was home, right? It was yeah, home. You're a New England guy. Yeah, yeah, it was home. And I always watched them from afar and, you know, really wanted to get them up to speed. Yeah. You know, and I think in my two years there, I think not only with the sports performance department, but the football program, we, you know, we were certainly competitive and more successful than they had been mm-hmm. uh, at the Division One level, which was awesome. And then, in 2018 so i was at ums for 16 and 17 and then in 2018 i came out here um and have been here for six years yeah this will be my sixth season yeah what a journey man take take me through just for the people watching too like who are some of the top athletes you've trained that people would know of i know Jadavon Clowney is, <clears throat> is one from south carolina sure yeah obviously um Clowney, Melvin Ingram, Alshon Jeffrey, Marcus Lattimore, Stephon Gilmore, DJ Swearinger, Devin Taylor, Cliff Matthews. I'm I'm sure I'm missing somebody. Uh, Connor Shaw. Yeah. You know, he was fantastic. You know, at Louisville, we had Bilal Powell, Victor Anderson, Hunter Cantwell, Josh Chichester. You know, UMass, obviously Andy Isabella, you. You know, I was hoping you, you put me in there. You, yeah. you, 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 you were a stud. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. Um, and some other guy, uh, Elijah Wilkinson. Uh, you Isaiah know, Rogers. Isaiah Rogers. Yeah. You know, and obviously, you know, some guys like Nikhil Har- Harry and and Brandon Ayuk, Rennell Wren. Yeah, and guys like that. That you know, from Arizona State. That um, it's been a it's been a great experience. You know. Yeah. I think those guys, just about everybody I listed, you know, they understood, you know, what it took, you know, with a lot of the things we're probably going to talk about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, um, um, I want to give that context so that when we talk about all this, people can realize the people, the, the great athletes you've been around and, and some of the high performers that you've seen. I forgot to mention Debo Samuel. Yeah. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's halfway decent. <laughs> he's halfway decent. Debo. Yeah. yeah. He's halfway decent. Yeah. Um, Real quick, and I think a part of this that fans are will be interested to hear is in college football, this the strength coach, and as we mentioned, there's a bunch of titles for it. I'm gonna call it a strength coach. Yours is sports performance, but strength coach It's ultimately what it, we are. Exactly. The title. Is um is as involved day to day with players as anyone, more so than the head coach. It's really a lot of a lot of head coaches call it the most important hire they make because strength coaches are with the players all the time. Position coaches and head coaches have limits on how much they can be with the players due to NCAA rules. So, um, so much of your job, we're going to talk about all the technical part and, you know, diet, nutrition and lifting, 
so much of your job is the um, the the human interaction side of it mm -hmm. is being the leader, being the motivator, being the shoulder to cry on. I mean, you and I have had conversations. I've gone to you for advice on everything from life to career to everything, you know, personal, on the field, off the field. How much do you lo love that part of it? And as you mentioned, you mentioned a little bit, like so many, a lot of strength coaches will know how to do a lift, but how do you get the guy, how do you get the player to believe in himself, to know that he can do it, to know that he can go lift 400 pounds and he just doesn't believe it yet? Like, talk to me about that side of your job. That's the, that, I mean, ultimately, that's why I do what I do. There's so many nuances to it. Yeah. And I think a lot of those things you just mentioned often take time to develop as a coach. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the number one goal for us is to build confidence. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different routes in order to do that. Um, for me, building the relationship and understanding that, you know, the old cliche, right? You know, they got to know how much you care and, and, but it, however you spin it, ultimately it's about the athlete. Mm -hmm. It's about what they, do they believe in you? Do they believe that your message is true and accurate and showing the athlete that things can happen that they didn't think could potentially happen yeah. and that happens on a daily basis uh, i think that's that's super important and for me the the relationship that i have with former players current players is the most important thing up until you know the birth of my daughter i always used to talk about how i had 115 sons mm -hmm. and i still believe i do um i always talked about how you guys were my family and the athletes I've coached still are. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's every year it grows to a bigger family. And I think that just about anybody that's ever, that I've had a chance to coach knows that they could call me and I'd, pro I'd pick up. Mm -hmm. And if they needed something and I could help, I would. Yeah. Uh, I think that's super important, but to your first point, you know, we are allowed to spend more time with the athletes than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see strength coaches getting assistant head coach titles now, yeah. because the head coach ultimately understands that the person that drives their message home is the strength coach, yeah. um, whatever their title is, it's the strength coach. And if they want to have a consistent message that gets conveyed where everybody's speaking the same language and everybody's on the same page, then they need to have somebody that they can trust in that position. Yeah. I love it. Um, let, let's get into it a little bit. My, my first thing, so many people talk about optimizing performance, right? And that may be the title of this, of this podcast, optimizing performance. What does that actually mean? Especially when it comes to athletes, but also compared to regular, like regular human beings, mm -hmm. what does it mean when someone says uh, we want to optimize performance? The answer to a lot of your questions today is probably going to be it depends. Yeah, <laughs> because not only does it depend on what the definition is for the person, mm -hmm. but ultimately it might depend on the person as well and their physiology or their psychology. Yeah. So. Optimizing performance to me is also something that constantly changes. You know, I use the analogy of a cliff, right? Like you want to get as close to that cliff as you possibly can without falling off. But then that cliff moves away from you mm -hmm. because you've been there and you've, you've seen that and you felt that. And it's a never ending journey throughout your life. Yeah. It just may progress or regress depending on, so many different factors mm -hmm. um you know the recovery the the sleep the nutrition the hydration the the training um the stress mitigation the there's so many variables that you have to consider on a daily basis as an athlete and some people are really good at managing all those variables and some people just need one variable to get really good at and then you give them another one and then another one ultimately that's you know you see somebody that's been in 
been working with, you know, our, 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 our staff for two, three, four, five, six years, sometimes even seven years, yeah. those individuals will have a, a bigger toolbox to be able to pull things out of, to be a pro. Yeah. Cause ultimately everybody we coach wants to be a pro. And whether that's being a pro at the NFL level or being a pro in, in life, in selling life insurance and optimizing sort of some of the mental side of things and being able to live a long life or be a pro at being a, a father or a husband or whatever it is, longevity, it's, it's all part of sort of the ultimate pie chart of what's important at different times, yeah. if that makes sense. So when you have an athlete that comes into your program, you get a kid, whether it's a transfer, whether it's a, a high school player, a person you're training for the first time, what are the things when they first get there that you're checking or monitoring to, you know, kind of get a baseline of where they're at from a performance standpoint? I know you have a, a process for mm -hmm. when you get an individual. Yeah, typically, you know, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a body composition assessment. Um, we utilize the in-body for that. It's the most efficient tool we found to, to get a large volume of athletes through relatively quickly. Like, and there's a margin for error in all body composition assessments, whether it's bod pod, So that DEXA. gives you what, body fat? And yes, it yeah. gives us a ton of information, like yeah. so much information we don't even use at all. <laughs> Well, you just kind of use the, the the big rocks, so to speak. You so used like, to try to get me to stand on that thing when and I would I would refuse to. Yeah, I don't know. I think it, I, there might have been a weight limit on it at the time, and <laughs> it, it just blinks red when you get on. No, I'm just unhealthy. Yeah, unhealthy. yeah, yeah. This, this guy needs some life changes. He yeah. needs his counseling <laughs> session with Coach Joe. <laughs> I love it. No, nah, so we use that. Yeah. <clears throat> we take um, anthropomorphic photographs. Um, we take obviously height, weight, mm -hmm. all the different, you know, measuring assessments. Um, we test, uh, we use a force plate. We test jumping and landing, which gives us an idea of what type of muscle the person's typically made of, whether they're a accelerator or a decelerator. And that kind of drives some things down the road. Uh, we test posterior chain with a, a Nord board. Um, and then ultimately we watch the athlete move and that, you know, to me, as somebody that's been doing this for a little while now, there is no tool mm -hmm. that can give you as much information as your eyes. Yeah. And that comes through experience, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of, a lot of guys, <laughs> a lot of you're, you've seen a lot of movement, you know, and, you know what clean movement looks like and quality movement looks like and what poor movement looks like. And then you, you start training the athlete, you know, you start training them in pieces. You know, if you want them to get really good at a certain lift, typically you segment that lift up and train certain sections of that lift so that the athlete gets really good at the pieces. So when he ultimately gets to the full lift, he's really good at it because he's yeah. done all the parts, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, you know, one of the things that you know, sports performance is so trendy in that it goes in these waves of, you know, different things come and go. But ultimately, what I've found is that externally loaded movement is the single best way to get better movement. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean, externally loaded movement? Some sort of weight Got it. going through a range of motion. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a barbell or it could be a kettlebell. It could be a dumbbell. It could be a weight vest, but ultimately the, a movement, a loaded movement through a range of motion is the best way to clean up movement. It's just like practice. The, yeah. You know, if you want to get better at, you know, shooting a basketball, what do you do? You shoot, you, you get really good at shooting a basketball by shooting a basketball yeah. and it's the same thing for movement. It doesn't, that doesn't change quickly. Typically it takes a little while for that to change. And, you know, ultimately that's what a good athlete, some people walk in with great clean movement and then all you got to do is get them stronger through that range of motion or more explosive through that range of motion or powerful 
faster, but if the movement's not there, that's sort of the first thing we look at. Okay. Take me through the, the core lifts that you have in your program that you believe in. I mean, I know what they are, but take me through each of them and the squat, the snatch, the clean, and why each of them are important. Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously, because you've been through it, but with my program that we use, I think it's not so much the lift as it is the plane. And, and what I mean by that is like, you know, a horizontal press with a horizontal pull or what, whatever. It, it, there's a balance to everything. And regardless of whether you're using a kettlebell, a dumbbell, a barbell, an Olympic lift, a, a power lift, mm -hmm. um, the plane that we want to train on a given day is there. And then the, the physiological adaptation we want to get during that phase is there. Sure. So if it's a hypertrophy phase, what are we doing to get that stimulus we want to get? Yeah. Right? I don't want to get too sciencey in it, but it ultimately... As a human being, all of us are adaptive, mm -hmm. meaning what we do to ourselves, our body adapts to relatively quickly. And the younger we are, the faster that adaptation occurs and the longer we can string it out. And then the older we get, the slower that adaptation occurs and the quicker we need to change things in order to continually get an adaptation, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So that's interesting. So when you come up with your kind of program for each, depending on the phase you're in, you just mentioned, um, you go through like cycles of lifting during the football off season and, and in season. So you're really backing into it by saying, you know, on this day we want a horizontal push and then you're finding, and then you're putting the lifts in from that standpoint. And then you're doing that for each day. That's how you plan it out. Yeah. The process is always starts with the goal. Yeah. And then we break it down from there. So if our goal is, hey, we have a, you know, a young team that needs to get bigger, how do we do that? Well, we do it, we, we need to elicit some hy hypertrophy here. We need to get bigger muscles um, because ultimately, especially in a younger population, bigger muscles typically turn into stronger muscles, which in turn turn into faster muscles, more powerful muscles. And so there's a process to that. And it's not a, we don't rush anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the analogy I always use, and, and you know this, is I like, to, I like to cook, and some of the best food I've had is slow cooked, right? It takes time, and the same thing goes for all these physiological adaptations that we're trying to elicit. It's not a rush. You can't rush lean mass gain. You can't rush strength. You can't rush power. It takes time. And even before all those things, you have to have the movement. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of that process kind of woven into our program with the sort of the block system we use with the different training age groups, which to me is super important. You know, we don't train an 18 year old the same way we train a 22 or 23 year old. It doesn't make sense, yeah. you know, and I've done that in the only reason I know that is because I've done it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You know, you see from an adaptation perspective, you see the first year, you see a lot of improvement. The second year, you see some, but maybe not as much. Mm -hmm. Third year, you might see a little bit, or the guy might stay the same. In the fourth yeah. year, they might actually get worse if you just took the same program and you did it for four years straight. Mm -hmm. So we analyzed that and we said, okay, what do we do to change that? Well, we have to change the stimulus. We have to change what we're adapting to. And so that's where that sort of comes from. And then obviously you can sprinkle in a little specificity with position-specific work. But ultimately, in my opinion, and I think it's a good opinion is that the weight room in particular, not the field, but the weight room is general. Mm -hmm. We're focused on qualities and characteristics that we just mentioned. The specificity comes from playing the sport, yeah. the sport of football. And that's where the position coach comes in. Yeah. Do we do some position specific things? you know, with conversations to make sure we're adapted to what practice looks like. Yes. Mm -hmm. But ultimately our job is to work in the general realm of the body mm -hmm. and not necessarily the, the specificity of the sport that often. So uh, of all the lifts that are part of the program, the squat, clean, overhead, snatch, um, 
bench, what's the lift that you think that's most important for people to continue doing throughout your playing career and also throughout life as you're getting into yeah. your 30s and 40s? What's the what's the one lift that's like you, you, you can give everything, everything else up, but don't stop doing this? Well, I think you know the answer to this one. It's going to be squat, right? Yeah, it's a squat. And it doesn't have to be. God, I hate that answer. It, ha- it doesn't have to be. Listen, you were a good squatter. Yeah. You know, people, I remember that was the one question I always got asked. Is this, you know, is, does he lift lower body? I'm like, yeah. hell yeah, he lifts lower body. I'm not letting him get away with that. And you did. But, yeah, it's to me, it's the squat. And I think that mm-hmm. it's more about the pattern and the ability to continue to do that for your entire life. Mm-hmm. Could you do, you know, Olympic cleans for your whole life? Maybe. It's a tougher, tougher exercise to sort of have that lasting power because yeah. there's a lot of variation you can do to a squat. It doesn't mm-hmm. it can be a bodyweight squat, it can be a barbell loaded yeah. squat, it can be any Front type squat, of squat, yeah. you know. Yeah. And the second thing about that exercise in my world, in the college world, is it's hard. Mm-hmm. And I think Oftentimes, in today's world of sports performance, people lose sight of the fact that, like, really difficult, challenging things are, they're priceless. Yeah. Like, you have to do those things. sucks. It's hard. You yeah. think it does. I think it's great. Yeah. Well, you, you're, you're different. I sort of like, <laughs> I sort of breed. like the pain, you know, and, yeah. and listen, I'm, you know, I'm 40 now, mm-hmm. like, I'm still... Doing it. Are you 40 now? Yeah, I'm 40 years old, believe wow. that or not. Wow. My barber gave me a great, us, huh? great compliment. Yeah, snuck up on me too. <laughs> barber gave me a great compliment the other day. He's like, dude, I told him we we're talking about something. And he's like, You're 40. And I'm like, it's like, no way. He's like, you look 34, 33. Yeah. And I was like, well, it's because I I take care of myself. Yeah. You know, I try to not only preach it, but practice it. Yeah. And that is the thing. You're in there. Every morning you do the player's lift, right? For the most part, yeah. I mean, it's it's funny where I'm at now and the amount of new athletes we have. Mm-hmm. They're starting to figure that out because I don't publicize that very often. Like, I kind of like to just sort of do that. It's part of my preparation mentally for the day. Um, it's part of my process physically that I know I need to continue to do these things in some way, shape or form. And I plan on doing that for the rest of my life, but they're starting to, you know, guys are trickling in a little earlier or whatever. And they kind of look over and they're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. So does it create some, some clout? Yeah, I think it does. You know, that's part of it. And you know, there's shoot, man, you know, this, there's, there's plenty of strength coaches in this world that don't train. Yeah. They look terrible, some of them. Listen, I don't know if they're good or not. Yeah. They could be the greatest coach in the world. <laughs> but to me, I wouldn't feel comfortable mm-hmm. coaching somebody through something that I haven't felt yeah. or done or aren't an expert in. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. that's just part of my process. Mm-hmm. I want to talk through some of the like, trends going on in, in, you know, some of the, um, optimizing performance world of people talking about, um, different ways to, to get better for athletes, but also for just regular human beings that want to perform better. One is when to train versus when not to train, when to train hard and when to take it easy. And a lot of that's like with the new technology of like recovery scores, the whoop, how do you view it with your athletes? Like, how do you decide when it's time to go hard and when it's not? And how much of that are you adjusting? You may have a plan, but do you ever notice like, Hey, the guys like that, that was a little harder than I thought it was going to be. We need to tone it back tomorrow. Like how how do you, how do you balance that? Depends on the time of year. It's funny. You know, I have a, a Garmin watch, Mm -hmm. you know, I had a polar before and I have a, this car, I just got this um, for Christmas and it constantly tells me to stop. Don't train hard. Don't just relax. (laughs) Just take literally, it literally tells me to like relax and go breathe or go, you know, do whatever. So like, I'm thinking about getting rid of this watch, (laughs) you know, or calling Garmin and being like, guys, yeah, there's gotta be like a setting in this thing to stop making me like feel bad for working hard. That being said, depends on the time of year. Right. So 
the there is some merit, a lot of merit to listening to your body, but also listening to technology, but utilizing it as a tool and not excuse. like, yeah. yeah, an excuse, yeah. right? Exactly. Or just like going wholesale and like, oh, sh whoop says I shouldn't train today or <laughs> my Garmin says I shouldn't train today or my Polar said whatever it is. If you want to train, go train. Yeah. Just sort of be smart with it from a personal perspective. From a team perspective, it, during the off season, there's a progression to everything. Mm -hmm. And depending on how much time off happened before the start of the phase, or depending on if it's a phase where there's football practice or not, or a phase where we're in season, you have to take that into consideration mm -hmm. when you're programming for the athletes. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, one of my jobs is to sort of take our technology, break that down, and disseminate that information to the coaching staff so they can make decisions on practice loads, player loads, whether an athlete needs a down day or whether we need to go harder on a day. Yeah. And I've been super fortunate to work for some coaches that actually listen mm -hmm. to that information but they don't go wholesale on it because there is still a nuance of feel to all that stuff. Yeah. And again, you know, the answer is it depends. Yeah. It depends. Yeah. Uh, diet and nutrition. So you hear the saying all the time. I don't know what the percent is. Or like it's 90% diet, 10% actually working out or 80% diet. Like diet dictates everything. Is that true? I think it sort of depends on what your goals are. Yeah. Right? Like if ultimately it comes down to this, right? Two, two factors, really, when you talk about body composition, mm -hmm. okay? Number one is compliance. Mm -hmm. The diets that work are the ones that the people will do. Yeah. The individuals will do. They'll follow it, mm -hmm. right? And then the second factor in that is why does that work? If it's a weight loss situation, typically it's because they're in a caloric deficit of some sort. Mm -hmm. And if it's a weight gain situation, typically it's because they're in a caloric surplus. Mm -hmm. You can take all the different fad diets and sort of look at them and say, let's break this down. What, why is this diet, quote unquote, successful or not? Whether we remove a macronutrient or whatever it is, and ultimately it becomes down to caloric surplus or caloric deficit. Mm -hmm. That's still super important. Now, when you're talking about athletes, you can get much more in the weeds on that. So the types of macros, the, the types of food, the, the different things that they're eating do play a factor in inflammation, in yeah body composition, in performance, in sleep, um, in recovery, all the different sort of factors to that. So the answer is, yeah, it, it, it all matters. And that sort of goes back to, for me in my world, we sort of give the athletes, it's like college, right? Like you, you walk into college as a freshman and you're not taking 400 or 500 level classes. Yeah. You're taking 100 level classes. So we try to do it in a similar realm in regards to our education for our guys, whether it be diet, nutrition, recovery, hydration, yeah. strength training. There's a big trend of professional athletes going vegan. I started by, was it Tom Brady maybe? Did he do it or? He's not was vegan. He, was he, he was no dairy, I think, was he started that whole trend. But there's, a, there's been a trend of mm -hmm. the vegan, no dairy, whatever it is. Um, what are your thoughts on the? I know you're not a big vegan guy because uh, you, you like to you like to grill some meat. But what, what what are your thoughts on the vegan diet? Can you give me an example of a successful professional athlete that was vegan? I can't. Can we look it up on the Chris Paul? Yeah. Okay, Chris Paul. Chris Paul. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's really, really, really hard to do. Yeah. And typically what you see is that somebody 
goes vegan. Mm -hmm. And let's define that. That means no meat products, no dairy, mm -hmm. right? That's just vegetables and legumes and, and that. Yeah. Impossible burger. Yeah. Whatever that is, <laughs> you know, whatever that's made of, right? <laughs> Certainly, I'm sure it's, you know, really if it's healthy. made in a lab, it must be healthy, <laughs> right? Um and it's certainly more healthy healthy than a steak, I, yeah. I would assume, right? <laughs> no, my, my point is that typically what you see is an athlete will go vegan and they'll feel good. Mm. They'll feel good sort of right off the bat. And ultimately they feel good because they probably didn't have great dietary habits to begin with. Yeah, they cut out all the bad stuff. And now they're not eating anything bad. They're yeah. eating vegetables, mm. which is great. There's nothing wrong with vegetables. They're fantastic. And we're not even talking about like the, the philosophical reasons for going vegan, right? In regards to slaughter of animals and all that yeah. stuff. That's different. Pure performance. This is just performance. <laughs> yeah. But you'll see them and they'll feel really good. Mm -hmm. But normally what happens is they get hurt. Mm -hmm. And they sort of reevaluate some things. And they start to add some sort of meat products back into their diet. Yeah. And... It's, it's too hard to recover from the demands of a sport, mm. in particular at the professional level, without taking in adequate amounts of protein. Mm. You know, the, the, mo the most recent data for an athlete is one-to-one, -one, right? Every pound you are, it's how many grams of protein you need really? in a day. Wow. So if I'm 245 pounds... I need to take 245 grams of protein in, in a day. Now there's, there's some variation to that, yeah. but it's close. And doing that by eating beans and legumes and, and yeah. spinach is, is just not, number one, it's not sustainable. Number two, you, it's really hard to do because you have to consume so much of that mm -hmm. from a digestion perspective. I, I don't know what yeah. that would look like, but I'm sure it's not pretty. Yeah. Um, and you also see those athletes' bodies change pretty dramatically when that happens. Typically, they lose a lot of muscle mass. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's one of those things. Listen, everybody has their reasons for doing what they do. Mm -hmm. All I all I'll say is that I think all too often professional athletes follow trends as opposed to following sort of the science in their 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 heads, yeah. and the science says that you should, you should probably consume some yeah. lean protein, whether it's fish, you know, beef, yeah. chicken, pork, whatever it is. But ultimately that's, that's a driver for recovery mm -hmm. from, from an athletic perspective. If you had autonomy over what your athletes ate every single day, what would be the diet you'd want them to follow? It would be a, a regular diet, meaning they would have, protein sources they would have carbohydrate sources they would have good fats and they would have their vegetables and their plate would look like if you just filled up your plate you know 20 to 30 to 40 grams of protein every meal you know you get your carbohydrates every meal you have your fat your good fats every meal like a you know studies show that whether you eat carbohydrates or not doesn't determine body composition yeah. If you're, if you're, your calories are aligned with your expenditure, mm -hmm. right? Caloric demand, caloric intake. It's, it's all part of the, yeah. part of the puzzle. It's not the carbs, it's the calories. And from an athletic perspective, like what fuels performance in an anaerobic fashion is glucose and glycogen, mm -hmm. which is a stored form of carbohydrates. Yeah. So you have to have them if you want to perform at a high level. Now, listen, I've done low carb diets to lose weight in the past. And ultimately what I found was that my performance decreased, my ability to perform decreased. Now there's a lot of nuance to that. And there's different things you can do to sort of manage some of that. But ultimately that's what it should look like, yeah. you know, and understanding what a clean plate looks like, a good quality meal looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get athletes that don't know what a protein is, a carbohydrate is, yeah. what a fat is. So like that's how regressed some of that education has to be 
you know, for them to understand what that is. And then, okay, what's quality protein look like? Mm -hmm. What's a quality carbohydrate look like? Mm -hmm. Is, um, you know, a bag of Doritos the same as some white rice? No, it's not. Yeah. Is, a you know, I don't know, a, a crappy steak the same as a, a grass fed ribeye? No, it's not. So there's nuance there too. Yeah. Let, let's go into supplements a little bit. Supplementation. Mm -hmm. uh, what, how do you, how do you help your athletes find the best ones? And what's, what's kind of your philosophy? Some, there's some people that are anti supplements that you should be getting it in your diet versus some who, you know, are big advocates of supplements. I think in my world, it starts with real food first mm -hmm. and the supplement is the cherry on top of the giant Sunday that's already been made. Mm. There's, there's a few supplements that are uh, important that we do give um, a multivitamin is one of them. Fish oil is another. Uh, I tend to recommend vitamin D mm -hmm. quite often. Um, I can't give them vitamin D, but I recommend it. And that's probably going to change. Um, I also can't give them creatine. But, uh, you know, I, I may recommend it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm talking about when I say recommend it, that's to our athletes that have been in the program for a little while that have great habits outside of the facility. Yeah. If I have an athlete that stays up till 4 in the morning, 5 grams of creatine is not going to help that athlete. Right. Some A good night's sleep will help that athlete. Yeah. So there's there's nuance to that. And, again, that comes from – the relationship, getting to know this, this, every athlete as an individual, figuring out what their social life is like, figuring out where they have good habits or not, whether they're consistent. And then once they are, they sort of earn that sort of badge from, from us. Then you can sort of take it to the next level. There's a lot of talk about creatine, which you just mentioned. When's the right time for someone to take creatine? You know, I remember back in the day asking my mom when i was like 14 hey this creatine stuff yeah. is supposed to be unbelievable <laughs> and she bought it for me yeah and, and i took it and i don't i don't think i noticed a thing mm -hmm. because i didn't know what i was doing you know what i mean like i just yeah. saw it like it was a trendy thing mm -hmm. creatine is the single most researched supplement i would say there is out there yeah. And the more and more the smart folks research it, the more and more they realize that it has even more benefits than what we thought. Mm -hmm. Not only performance-based, but um, for improvements after, you know, brain injury, mm -hmm. for improvements in cognition. I've heard people describe creatine as a nootropic. Yeah. You know, th those are all things that we probably didn't realize creatine did. Super important, mm -hmm. you know, super important. But ultimately, creatine is just something that is in our food. And if technically, if our food intake is perfect, you probably don't need it. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue as an athlete, you probably still do maybe. Um, depending on the person, depending on the situation. I hadn't taken creatine in probably three years. I, I just started taking it again. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I feel better or not just yet, but I'm taking it, you know, five, eight, whatever it is, grams a day because yeah. I'm a little bigger. Mm -hmm. And it's based on all the research that I've been doing. Yeah. You know, that's, it, it's part of that trial yeah. Of, of things and shoot if i could get my 75 year old mom to take it i would yeah. because it probably benefit her a lot yeah. you know for the people watching this what are there a couple of supplements or vitamins that you believe everyone should take is it the what you what you give to your players the multivitamin the fish oil or is it too hard to say without knowing the individual it depends listen i can't like you don't want to just blanket yeah. uh, a supplement right yeah there's so many nuances to people's physiology and what, you know, they can and can't do. I'll tell you what I take. I take four fish oil tabs a day. Uh, I usually use Carlson's or Nordic Naturals. 
um, ends up being about two grams of EPA and DHA. Mm -hmm. I take a magnesium supplement. I take a zinc. I take NAC. Um, I take a, what's the other one? Um, it's bl I'm blanking on the other one, but uh, I take that every day. I take creatine. I take um, L-arginine. I take L-citrulline. I sort of make my own pre-workout. Mm -hmm. You know, we can talk about maybe stimulants at some point because that's uh, we're getting there. Yeah. That's a <laughs> that's a big hot ticket, obviously, for everybody nowadays. Yeah. And how you go about doing that, mm -hmm. but I think that's it. And I take that on a daily basis for general health. Yeah. <laughs> general health. Yeah. General health. You know, and it's it's part of my process. Yeah. And I just think it's it's really important. Let's talk alcohol. And it, there's a big kind of a trend right now, too, about people going off of drinking and a lot of talks about the effects of alcohol. Let's talk about it first for athletes and then also for everyday people. Like, what have you seen with as far as how alcohol can affect performance, not just obviously like in the present, but like for days after? Um, a he like heavy drinking for athletes. When I once I started tracking my sleep, mm -hmm. probably six or seven years ago. One of the things that I would do just as an experiment on myself is Friday night, Saturday night, go out to dinner with the wife, have a couple glasses of wine. Right. What I've noticed and what I've realized over the last you know six or seven years of tracking my sleep is that. One single drink close to bedtime mm -hmm. absolutely destroys my sleep. Mm -hmm. It's done. You might as well take that night and throw it out. No matter how long you lay in bed, yeah. it's, it's every device I have yells at me. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of anything other than what the alcohol does to you from the inside. Now, we're not even talking about the hormonal response to that whether it's the alcohol or whether it's the lack of sleep due to the alcohol that compounds the hormonal effects of that. Super, super important to avoid it at all costs. Now, I'm not naive. I understand who the demographic is I'm working with. And I also understand that people need to go out and be social and have a good time for a quality of life and to feel good. So I think the, the biggest thing is to try to educate yourself on how to mitigate some of the negative effects of alcohol and not. Now, one thing, if I know that, you know, I'm in an event or I have something planned where I may have some alcohol, typically what I like to do is do that during the day. Because by the time I go to sleep, I don't have a negative sleep because of yeah. that alcohol. So, which is really interesting to me. It's like five hours, mm -hmm. you know? So if I go to bed at 10 o'clock and five o'clock hits, yeah. you know, I'm, then I start my Done. mitigation procedures, yeah. so to speak, mm -hmm. to get myself ready for bed. I'm often okay. But there's still the alcohol ingestion and the effects of that mm -hmm. that you get you just don't have the compounded effects of the sleep as yeah. well you mentioned the mitigation is there anything that you tell your athletes or would tell just everyday people who still want to perform well and sleep well after drinking that you can do you know say say it's say you don't stop by five o'clock but you are home by 10 is there hey drink a pedialyte make sure you eat something, what is the mitigation of effects if you do happen to drink it at later and still want to have decent sleep? Right. Well, you, you mentioned it, the, the rehydration part. Mm -hmm. But then again, you know, what happens when you drink a ton of liquid right before bed? Yeah, you're you're getting bed. up all night <laughs> and you're going to the bathroom. So then it negatively affects your sleep too. So there really isn't one thing, but certainly – Liquid IV, Pedialyte, Drip Drop, all the different, mm -hmm. you know, element, all the different types of sort of electrolyte things are 
it's not a bad thing to consider. Um, but ultimately, for me, personally, I try to avoid it at all cost. And within, you know, within reason to still be able to be social and, and do what you need to do. But and, and listen, this is this is coming from somebody that did all the wrong things in his younger days. All the wrong <laughs> You've things. <been> there. <laughs> all of them. Yeah. You know, uh, being a division one athlete and doing all the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And I always thought I was a step ahead. But in reality now, knowing what I know, I wasn't mm -hmm. in reality. Yeah. And that's one of my biggest regrets as a, as a man is that how much better could I have been when I was younger if I didn't make some of the choices that I made in my life? Because I know now as, as a 40 year old, how alcohol affects me because I have data and analytics that tells me that. And then I also have my opinion. I didn't know that when I was younger, I didn't have that data and those analytics and I didn't, even realize or acknowledge that it was so bad. Mm -hmm. So for me, I really like to educate certainly my athletes on all those things we just talked about because oftentimes they don't know yeah. or they think, oh man, I'm a beast. Yeah. I'm a beast, man. I can, I, I can go out all night <laughs> yeah. and I can kill your workout the next day. I said, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe, but you can't do it every day, you know, and, and you probably could have been better if you didn't, but yeah. You're that freaky that maybe you can get away with that sometimes. Yeah. I, I remember when I was at Penn State, um, one of our strength coaches there used to always say that if you had a big workout, like if you did big squat Friday and then you went out Friday night, that you ruined the last three days of workouts that you just did. Is that total BS or is there some kind of validity to like to that or some data that points to that? It, it depends. Um, I've seen really high responders to training. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, really, really freaky gifted athletes that had a pretty hefty social life and still made incredible gains in the program. Mm -hmm. I've also seen some athletes that couldn't sustain the workload. And ultimately, well, one of two things happens, they get sick, or they get hurt. And what those two things are is your body telling you, you can't do this at the pace you're doing it because I'm not yeah. on board with this. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of negative implications to that, you know, obviously. Let, let's talk sleep. Um, you mentioned the alcohol effects of sleep, but uh, I think, again, with like the trend of the watches and stuff, people are starting to see their sleep better and, 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 figure out how to optimize it. What do you do to optimize your sleep? Because I know you have like a nighttime routine and and um, and what have you seen the effects of, you know, good sleep versus bad sleep on performance? So I just want to say that you are uh, ahead of your time. You are a trendsetter because you used to tape your mouth shut mm -hmm. at night in so 2016, 2017. Yeah. And... That was weird. Everyone thought I was the weirdest. Everyone ever. thought you were the craziest they dude ever. They all make fun of me for it, man. <laughs> even, even me. Yeah. Now, I knew that there could potentially be some yeah. positive effects to that because I knew that mouth breathing is mm -hmm. terrible for your central nervous system in recovery and nasal breathing is really, really good to be able to relax. So I let, I let you kind of go with that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but now you see, I mean, I have hostage tape at my house that I use. Yeah. Um, so one thing I did, I'm trying to think, this was probably five years ago maybe, I went and got a sleep study done. Mm -hmm. And as a 245 pound, 250 pound guy with a big neck mm -hmm. that always thought he slept well, it was something that I wanted to kind of take a look at. Mm -hmm. So I did, sure enough, sleep apnea. Right. My wife's been telling me this for years. I just dealt with it. I dealt with the fatigue of not getting good sleep. Mm -hmm. So I went, I did my sleep study, sleep apnea, got my CPAP, got used to it. 
And once I got used to my CPAP after probably a week, 10 days, my sleep dramatically improved. My recovery from workouts at an older age improved. My body composition improved. I lost fat. I gained muscle just from the sleep that I was getting. It's, it's a game changer. And now I've actually added the mouth tape to my CPAP. So now I'm only nasal breathing because I had the, the mask that goes over your mouth and sits up against your nose. So now I just tape my mouth shut and I have the nasal only, much more comfortable. And now I've seen an even bigger improvement in that. Mm-hmm. We, if you are north of 250 pounds and you have some muscle on you and you have a large neck, you probably have sleep apnea. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a whole insurance process you have to go through for all that. But ultimately, you're going to find that you get better sleep with a CPAP than you would without it. Yeah. And our entire O-line has an NIL deal with a CPAP company. Mm-hmm. Lofta, I think it's called, right? Yeah. They have to. You know, and I, that was my recommendation. Yeah. Because I was like, guys, listen you may be able to go through this process and they may or may not say you have it, but ultimately you're going to get improved sleep if you can get used to wearing this thing every yeah. night. Now, is it going to maybe negatively affect your social life? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Like, are you going to bring that over your, your, your girl's, girl's house? house? Probably <laughs> not, you know, but <laughs> if you can get, yeah. you know, five, six nights of sleep with that, it'll drastically improve. Now, in regards to my process for sleep, it's pretty elaborate. You know, I, turn all the lights out in my house about an hour before. There's no blue light. There's no phones. There's no television. Mm -hmm. Um, Typically, I sort of wind myself down. I take my magnesium. Mm -hmm. Um, I take sort of my last little sips of water. I make my way into the bedroom. I take a hot shower, um, brush my teeth, get changed, get into bed, lights are dim. There's no real electrical devices in my room. Mm -hmm. Um, I read Mm -hmm. an actual book. I'm not reading a screen. I I read an actual book before bed. I set my watch alarm. I put my book down. I tape my mouth shut. I put my CPAP on and I'm asleep within 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And it's all part of the process um, for that. I also utilize my sauna and my breath work mm-hmm. on usually four to five nights a week, super important. Mm-hmm. And what I found is that when I utilize my sauna two hours before bed, my sleep improves even more. So it's just all about refining your process mm-hmm. and adding different tools to your process. Yeah. And you're not lying either. I know I've texted you a couple of times at like eight o'clock and you don't text back after 8 PM. Mm-mm. You're not on your phone. Mm-mm. I'm like, I know he's still up, but you're not. You're, <laughs> I'm, you're, I'm in my process. You're, you're in your process. I'm in the launch sequence. It's <laughs> yeah, over. You yeah. know, you can't you go back. back at three 30. Yeah. You're going to get a text bright and early. That's for <laughs> yeah. sure. Um, it, it's the, the whole sleep apnea thing is definitely, um, again, because of some of it, because of the watches people wear that track your sleep. Uh, I was listening to a podcast. Larry Fitzgerald was talking about how he went through his whole pro career with sleep apnea and didn't know it until mm-hmm. he, until he got done. And, um, and it's been interesting. Did you ever see, I know you do blood work sometimes. Mm-hmm. Did you see blood pressure go down or like glucose levels go down when you fix your sleep apnea? So blood pressure went down and my red blood cells count went down. Interesting. Yeah. So I had actually elevated, little, slightly elevated blood pressure mm-hmm. and a slightly elevated hematocrit level in my blood work. So I get blood work done twice a year, yeah. um, a whole full panel. And I think, you know, for a professional athlete, Game changer, got to do it. Yeah. You know, a lot of them don't, but they they should. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of what I do is for me and my health, but also so that I can experience it. It goes back to the, the workout part. Mm-hmm. I have to experience it and know what I'm looking at and go through that process so that now I can adequately educate the athletes and what that process yeah. looks like. But yeah. so I've seen normalization for my hematocrit, totally normal. Mm-hmm. Um, my blood pressure is totally normal. It's like low, um, resting heart rate down, everything, 
everything went right back to normal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that that was necessarily elevated for a long time because I'm not even super sure. I mean, I assume I've had sleep apnea my whole life, but I don't, you know what I mean? You don't no. know yeah. because it's just, it's it's in the background. It's in the peripheral. Yeah, you could have had it for two years or 15. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. you know, because I've always been a bigger guy. Yeah. You know, since I was 12 years old, I've been north of 220. Yeah. It's just, I've always it's been a bigger boy. guy. Yeah. And it's, it's, so who knows when it actually started or whether it was just a slow progression over time, but it's noticeable yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. Stimulants, caffeine, the great performance enhancer. Is that true? Is, is caffeine the best, you know, is caffeine great to have pre-workout? Is it, is it great for enhancing cognitive function and, and performance in lifting and athletically? And then what are the side effects and the negatives of, of it? Uh, again, the answer is it depends. It depends on the person. So there's really two types of people, uh, people that metabolize caffeine really quickly and people that metabolize it really slowly. And, you know, everybody's got a friend that can drink a cup of coffee and then go to sleep. I'm on the far opposite side of that. So for me, I'm super sensitive to caffeine in general. If I have a cup of coffee, I'm up for two days. <laughs> and that, again, also too with caffeine is it's dose dependent. Mm -hmm. And just like any other drug, there's an adaptation to that over time. So if you start with 100 milligrams of caffeine, let's just say, after a while, that 100 milligrams of caffeine isn't going to have the same effect. So, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, for people that can tolerate caffeine, caffeine is a tremendous performance enhancer. Um, it, you know, coffee is one of the biggest businesses on the planet for a reason. And essentially the reason why coffee is a big business is because of caffeine. And it's, it increases your ability to um, withstand endurance activity. It increases your ability to produce power. Mm -hmm. It increases your work capacity. Now, with that being said, what I typically recommend for general population, typically don't recommend caffeine very often or at all for athletes that I coach um, is use it when you're going to need it the most mm -hmm. and only use it infrequently. For me, I'll have a cup of coffee, you know, most days. But when I need to perform at a high level physically, I may have two. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing with caffeine, and to me, the problem with caffeine is that number one, it's in damn near everything now. Mm -hmm. And number two, the supplement industry is not a regulated industry. And when you're talking about pre workout in particular or energy drinks, things of that nature, the problem is it's not regulated. The labels typically are, they're convoluted mm -hmm. and the companies are smart. So they hide certain things in there. So the education for our athletes on how to, lead, how to read a label is super important. One of the things I tell them to try to avoid is the term proprietary blend mm -hmm. or matrix blend or whatever the term is, the fancy term that the supplement company uses, because that's where they put all the stuff that they don't have to tell you. Yeah. They might put the name of it, but they don't put the amount yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is it's relatively addictive, mm -hmm. whether it be physiological or psychological, it's kind of irrelevant. It's, it's a relatively addictive feeling for a lot of people. And oftentimes people rely on it to train. I have to take my Jack 3D in order to go to the gym. Yeah. 
that's a problem. And oftentimes when you see those individuals remove that from their process, mm -hmm. they're going to feel crappy for a little while, but then ultimately they're going to feel much better afterwards. Mm -hmm. So limiting that caffeine intake to as little as possible, as infrequently as possible, to me is, is a probably a great strategy. Um, and then ultimately you know, learning what the supplement companies are trying to do yeah. from a marketing perspective so that you can combat that and understand what mm -hmm. in particular you're putting in your body. Yeah. Because it's super important. If it's not NSF or informed choice, mm -hmm. you have no idea what's in there and you could fail a drug test yeah. like that. The, the thing with caffeine that I've noticed is how much it impacts my sleep as well. If I have it late, you know, if I have it, you know, I, I didn't even talk about that. Yeah. yeah. If I, if I have a cup of coffee past five o'clock or four o'clock, which is, I shouldn't, but you know, in sometimes in football world, coffee's run right. a lot. I can't lower my heart rate below 65 before I go to sleep. <laughs> you right. Know, you get terrible, terrible sleep. It's great that we have the ability to look at that now. Yeah. You know, cause it really does drive a lot of decisions you make on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. If there were, if it wasn't for some of the trackers we have, you probably just continue to have coffee and be like, and then it just yeah. rolls out of control. And then you're having three, four cups of coffee a day mm -hmm. instead of just the one or the, the none, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and it makes a big difference. And it's, it, it all ties into the same thing. Again, knowing what the things you're putting in your body are actually doing to you because a lot of people just, listen to a buddy or listen to a friend instead of educating themselves. Yeah. And again, that goes back to what I said. Like for me, what my, one of my primary jobs is to educate the athletes on what it is that they're doing and what those certain substances tend to do to certain individuals. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a bunch of the players that you've been around, the great athletes, uh, Javon Clowney, Brennan Ayuk, uh, Debo Samuel. What are the things that, all the highest performers have in common? I think that there's two parts to that. There's, I've been so fortunate to be around some of the, the freakiest athletes of all time. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, the one thing that I could pinpoint that they all have is that when the moment is big, they're there and they make a productive play. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that is physiological or psychological or both, I don't necessarily know the answer because I think each individual is different. But that is something that all those individuals were able to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I was amazed at I don't remember when it was, but it was Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. I, we might've talked about this, that they actually had like a heart rate monitor oh, on yeah. him. Crazy. He was, he had a higher heart rate on the sideline watching the defense mm -hmm. than he did when he was on the field running around yeah. executing. Yeah. To me, that's just a different thing. Mm -hmm. And however he's able to execute that, more power to him. I think some of the greats, have the ability to slow things down and calm themselves down and focus in really big moments mm -hmm. and then let their athleticism kind of do the rest. Yeah. You know, we could talk about the hard work, the discipline, the, the consistency, all those things, but ultimately to me, that's secondary to what we just talked about. Yeah. Now, does all those things add to the overall performance on a daily basis? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but, to me, it's that ability to control their emotions in, in a given situation that they know is massive yeah. and they can calm themselves down, reset themselves and continue to make plays without. The, the other really cool thing with the heart rate tracking, I think we talked about this, about this too, was they have it on the golf channel sometimes. You can see the golfers. And I was so fascinated with how they would show the heart rate of the guy putting on the putting green and his heart rate was like, you know, 120 as he's like walking up to his ball. And as he lines up and like his heart rate just drops and like goes to like 90, you know, like 85 as he's about to put the ball. 
And then as soon as he puts it, the heart rate spikes right back up to, you know, in the, in the moment of like watching it. And that's such a great, like th those that can lower their heart rate, calm down. Like same thing you see LeBron James on the foul line. He's always breathing through his nose and like, he's always taking deep breaths. How, how do you, do you think that's something you can train athletes to do? Or do you think it's, you either have it or you don't, so, like you're either a panicker in big moments or you are calm and you have the mentality to, to, to get it done. It's probably a little bit of both. I think it's a trained skill. I think you can teach yourself how to do that. And you now, thankfully, you can track that yeah. and you can really practice it. And if you want to get into the weeds on that, you certainly can. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a tremendous skill. And, you know, ultimately through breath work, you mentioned nasal breathing, mm -hmm. you know, taking a deep breath. Something as simple as taking two or three long, slow, deep breaths and then slow exhales it brings everything down. Now, sometimes you don't have the time to do that, mm -hmm. but you know, all those things are, are little tricks and tools to be able to calm your mind or to divert your attention to something else and focus on something else that, that does calm you down so that you can refocus on what you need to focus on from an athletic perspective. You know, those things are super important tools that can be learned. Um, we do, some of that with some of our older athletes. Um, and again, the reason why we do it with them is because they sort of have all the other stuff in line, right? It's, it's the 500 level class. Yeah, it's the last step. Uh, right. Yeah. About, hey, okay. And, 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 you know, ultimately it's probably something that the young athletes could benefit too, you know, but to be able to control your heart rate, control your breathing and control your level of stress, your level of excitation, is is in athletics is invaluable but really in life because you know shoot man i've gotten in arguments with my wife where i've had to use some of those calm down yeah. right just <laughs> take a breath lower for a second <laughs> yeah lower it down yeah. you know your blood pressure starts to go up face starts to get red start to yeah. get mad and angry and it's just, just calm down relax take a breath because mm. ultimately nothing really good happens when yeah. you're in fight or flight in today's world mm -hmm. right and that true like holy shit like i'm at i'm at level 10 mm -hmm. i can't think of a lot of things that are positive that happen in that event normally something gets screwed up yeah. Yeah. and you just gotta you gotta take it down now mm -hmm. there's an optimal level to excitation too mm -hmm. right so like yeah 10 is bad but seven's probably pretty good three is probably not optimal yeah. for something one <laughs> yeah. damn sure Very isn't yeah. but there's different nuances to that too like heart rate and excitation or it, the, the heart rate the central nervous system the brain and the focus they're all sort of individual components to that makes sense what one of the things i was looking forward to talking to you about is the movement with like liver king and the raw eating raw organs and raw meat are, are you are you eating raw liver every day is that something that you bought into and what are your what are your thoughts on it so i'll say this I, you know obviously being in the profession that i've been in for as long as i've been in in, in it um w was a skeptic of the liver king from the beginning yeah i i know damn well that you can't look like that yeah. and do the things you're doing yeah. and say the things you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. However, when I was probably 25, 26, 27, I was killing beef liver tabs mm -hmm. back in like the early 2000s mm -hmm. because it is a important thing for, for, for people from a performance perspective yeah. and in, in a general health perspective. Um, do you have to, it's just like anything else. Everything works sometimes, mm -hmm. but everything doesn't work all the time, yeah. you know, other than correct processes and procedures. And even then you have to rotate certain things around because again, it goes back to us being adaptive. We're an adaptive organism. We adapt to certain things, things come, things go. Mm -hmm. And in order to continue getting responses, you have to change. So, um, I, I do not buy uh, liver. I do not typically ingest anything raw because I don't want to get a parasite. I don't want to have mm -hmm. stomach issues, which 
is a real issue with eating raw foods. Eating raw liver. You know, I, listen, I got a parasite when I was in Mexico. And I think I told you this. When yeah. I first, first oh. got here, mm-hmm. I was really, really sick. And it took me about six, seven months through, I was seeing a doctor. I lost like 30 pounds. Really? Um, sick, inflammation. It was terrible. And I continued working and continued, you know, grinding through it. But on the inside, I was literally like dying. I was getting eaten from the inside out and I was able to come out of that. So I'm super aware of yeah. sort of the, the positives and negatives to that. And um, it, it was one of those things that certainly taught me a lot, you know, but yeah, I'm not typically eating, you know, liver testicles or, um, <laughs> Or whatever, uh, beef, beef testicles or liver or yeah. spleen or brain or anything like that. Um, I'll occasionally have sushi, yeah. you know, or a oyster. Mm-hmm. But um, that's few and far between. From And I don't typically recommend that. You know, yeah. we, we invented fire for a reason. <laughs> you know, back in the day, yeah. you know, even the cavemen had fire. Even the yeah. Maasai in Africa, they have fire. You know, and oftentimes they cook their food and they do it for a reason because it tastes better. It's more palatable. You can chew it and it kills a lot of the bad stuff in our food. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a list of some like not really rapid fire, but some advice questions that for everyday people that I think would would help. And you can kind of give us your thoughts on them. Uh, Ideal morning routine for someone trying to optimize performance. You know, I... I learn all my things from my past experiences from books and from a lot from social media and some of the influencers on social media that are doing the research behind these things. So, you know, if you have the opportunity to, you know, getting in sunlight, exposing your body to sunlight, setting your circadian rhythm, helping your hormone levels. It's, it's all the things that guys like Andrew Huberman say and, and, you know, all the different podcasts and, and it's all, that's all relevant. It's all the most, that's why I love the time we live in because information is right yeah, there, yeah. right away. And you can instantly put a lot of that stuff into your practice on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. But to me, that's, you know, obviously with the exception of maybe brushing your teeth, that's probably the first thing that somebody that has the time mm-hmm. should potentially do. Good sum up, yeah. Um, what would you say is, kind of the biggest myth you've seen about people about, about getting ripped or getting jacked that um you have to take steroids mm. to do it um do they help yeah probably i personally wouldn't know but yeah probably yeah. And, and it's one of the things that a lot of young people are doing nowadays Mm -hmm. without having all the things we've been talking about already Mm -hmm. as part of their process. And they're just jumping on whatever because somebody on TikTok told them it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. That to me is like the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) That our young people value someone on TikTok that they listen to for 30 seconds every time they open an app that that person must know what's best for them yeah um i think that's a big problem nowadays and i see you know people are freely talking about that Mm -hmm. and i just think it's a terrible terrible decision it's gonna mess you up for the rest of your life Do you think anyone can get jacked? Do you think part of it is hereditary? I think anyone can improve their body composition dramatically. Mm -hmm. Your start point does make a difference. um, But ultimately, I think everyone has the capability to, if their process is correct and their habits are right, to get quote unquote jacked. Now everybody's definition of jacked is a little different. Um, if the four of us in this room, you know, all define that, it would look mm-hmm. probably drastically different. But 
To a certain extent, yes, I do. Cold plunge and sauna. A lot of a lot of talk about it. It's how sauna can prevent heart disease. Cold plunge can do a bunch of things. Are you a you're a believer in it? I am. Yeah, I'm a believer in. I was a believer in it before Everyone it became <laughs> it became you know the thing that it is yeah. now. You know, I mean, there's been saunas in this world for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm. There's a reason for that, you know? And now we actually have the data to back up, just like anything else. It's like bro science. Yeah, The bro science was the opinions that were based on practice and result. Mm. And now we have data to back up a lot of that bro science yeah. with facts. And ultimately most of it, was relatively true for the most part. There's some things that weren't, but a lot of it was. It's the same thing with recovery modalities and, and techniques. Yeah. The sauna, super beneficial for general health. Mm -hmm. um, super be beneficial for decrease in inflammation. Super beneficial for um, your sleep and, and helping you with sleep. Uh, super beneficial for recovery. I, you know, I... I did, so this, how about this? So I did 30 straight days. So I got blood work done, pre-sauna, and then, and I test everything. Mm -hmm. So I had, I do my IGF-1, right? Which is a, a growth hormone marker. Mm -hmm. And I think I was like 38 years old at the time. And the, the marker on blood work for IGF-1 is like 300. That's like, when you have a 300 IGF-1, most people have to take growth hormone mm -hmm. to get to 300. So I was at like 220 and I did a 30 straight days of sauna and sleep and my process. But the really only thing I added was sauna. Mm -hmm. I got my blood work done again, I was 308. Wow. So my growth hormone level went Wow. Up 75, whatever mm. deciliter, whatever the, I don't, I don't know what the, the metric is, but it basically went from 225 to 308 in 30 days. And I had a, obviously a, a, a conversation with my doctor and he was like, are you taking growth like hormone. a growth hormone or a <laughs> yeah. peptide or something like that? And I was yeah. like, no. I was like, you know what I did? And he was like, what? I was like, I got in the sauna for 25, 20 minutes a day for 30 straight days. And he was like, he was like, no shit. Yeah. And I said, yeah. I said, that's the only thing that I changed. That's remarkable. So that's how, for me, yeah. it's just my experience, but that's how important that can be yeah. for, for a recovery tool. Yeah. Um, how does someone get in shape? Dumb it down at the, to the basic, most basic level. Move more and eat less. I could use some of that, yeah. No, seriously, <laughs> like, okay what's your definition of get in shape right again yeah. so everybody's going to be a little different but caloric deficit mm -hmm. move more start somewhere take the first step the biggest thing i see to people is that that they're not doing is just not starting mm -hmm. just start and then once you start don't stop whatever it is you could take a walk every day yeah. start there take a, and then add another walk in mm. right whatever it is start go to the gym start to learn start to educate yourself but start somewhere yeah and be smart about how you start don't start too fast because you're probably going to get hurt because guess what you've been sitting on your ass for 10 years <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. so there's there's find someone that can help you with that mm -hmm. whether it's a, a a personal trainer or a strength coach or a friend that you know is educated in it whatever it is find somebody and start or on the opposite end of the spectrum if you don't want to do anything physical learn more about nutrition and diet mm -hmm. figure out what your basal metabolic rate is on a given day and then start tinkering with your calories start figuring that out mm -hmm. it's it's all a, a part of the growth process um and ultimately just starting 
and then not stopping because what we do in this world is we start and we do really well for a while and then we fall off the edge of the cliff yeah. and we stop. Yeah. And then we got to try to climb up that cliff and it's too hard and then we just stay at the bottom mm -hmm. and we go about our lives, yeah. you know? So it's being consistent and just starting, taking the first step, mm -hmm. the most important thing. Which sports, which, which sport has the best athletes, would you say? That's a super hard question. Um, because again, all right, what's your definition of athletes, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that every sport, and this is where like sports performance and sports performance coaches are, mm -hmm. are, are valued and educated in because every sport has a different type of demand physiologically. Football is different than soccer. It's different than basketball. It's different than baseball. It's different than golf. Mm -hmm. The demands of the sport are different. So I can't really answer that question because it's, it's too nuanced, mm -hmm. right? Like if you said, which sport has the best hand-eye coordination, yeah. I'd probably say baseball because you got to hit a 95 mile an hour round ball with a round bat and you got 0. 0.2 seconds to do it. That's pretty hard, you know? Yeah. If you said, which sport has the fastest athletes? I would say track and field, mm -hmm. you know, the, the 100 meter guys, the 60 meter guys. Yeah. You know, I, if you said, which sport has the biggest human beings on the planet? I'd probably say football offensive linemen, you know? So there's, there's so many nuances to it. Yeah. Um, ultimately, if you're competing at an elite level in any sport, you are the 1%. You are the the athlete that has something different or you develop something different over time to get you to where you are mm -hmm. so that's a that's a super nuanced question political answer but it was a it, listen yeah. i learned from the best yeah, yeah I, I taught you that yeah talk around the question talk yeah. around the question <laughs> give a couple sprinkle in some yeah. detail right uh, pass it along move it along uh, the one thing i just thought of as you were saying that when it comes to athletes can you coach and improve speed and twitchiness and quickness? Yes, I think so. Mm. Now, the percentage at which you're going to do that is all dependent on the athlete and its and his or her individual qualities. Yeah. So, can I take somebody that runs a five five forty and make them run a four three? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But can I get him to run a five zero? Five one, probably. Mm -hmm. Can I take somebody that run, you know, that can jump a thirty-five inch vertical and get them to forty-five or forty-four? Probably not, but I can probably get them to, you know, thirty-eight, thirty-nine. So there's got to be some, um, some nuance to that and some patience to that. I think mm -hmm. particular sport coaches often think that, you know there can be these monumental changes in a person and that's, it can happen, but it's, it's relatively rare. Yeah. What's, uh, what's your best story from training, uh, clowny? Um, so there's a few, <laughs> um, he's great. And, you know, I was able to spend some time with him after the fact after our three years together, yeah. um, when he was with the Texans, and I'm super proud of the man he's sort of become. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's a family man. He's got you know he's, he's got a child, and um, he's he grew up a lot, and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So there's one time that um, so what I did to hedge my bet was I had a. His, his roommate gave me a key to their apartment. Mm -hmm. So I had a key and it just happened to be right across the street from our facility. So um, he went there one day, I went over there, knocked on the door, no answer, opened it, mm -hmm. went over to his room, knocked on the door. He's, in, you know, he's sleeping. And uh, I'm like, let's go. You got trained. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to. It, was, it wasn't pretty, the yeah. response, obviously. Ultimately, he came in and he trained that day. Mm -hmm. And 
I think for me, you know, that was a W. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ultimately, he may not have realized it in the moment, but I'm sure he does now that that was a W for him too. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a learning experience for him that in the moment he probably thought I was an asshole and, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have his best interest in mind, but ultimately all that came from the fact that I cared about him and that I wanted him to be the best he possibly could be. Mm -hmm. And, um, he, he came in and he trained and, and we got the job done. Yeah. Right. That's every day. You got to get the job done one way or another. And, um, we did that day. Yeah. You, you and I have talked a lot about the trend of, you mentioned a little bit, but strength coaches in football, getting assistant head coaching titles, some getting into on the field coaching. And we've talked before. I, I've said that I think at some point you'll see strength coaches become head coaches in college football. Where do you want to be in 10 years? You know, you're four, you just said you're 40. Mm -hmm. You're extremely young still. I had all this experience and one of the best in the country. Like, where, What's your goal? Where do you want to be? I, um, I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I think that, to, to touch on your first point, I think that the strength coach is one of three people within a football organization that addresses the entire team on a daily basis, mm -hmm. maybe daily strength coach, definitely daily. Mm -hmm. So you have the special teams coach, the strength coach and the head coach. Mm -hmm. The sort of hang up to maybe a strength coach getting a head coach job mm -hmm. is probably recruiting because we don't go on the road and we don't recruit. Yeah. We're not involved with that. But I do know that someday some athletic director will take a chance on a strength coach mm -hmm. to be the head coach. And I guarantee you it works out well mm -hmm. because the recruiting part, there's nuance to it. We're all educated on the rules. We know the rules. We can't actually execute the, the recruiting piece, but the knowledge is there. Mm -hmm. You just need a staff to be able to help you do that. So I don't think it's as big of a hurdle as some people think. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, one day, I wouldn't mind trying that. Mm -hmm. Potentially, in the right situation, given the right environment. But that would have to be an extremely sort of rare situation. Mm -hmm. I love what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy being where I'm at. Um, I think it's a, it's a great place to raise a family. It's a great place to, to live. Um, I think that the staff I work for now is tremendous. They're great. Um, and the sky's the limit for the potential. I don't really have a, like a golden goose in regards to like where I'd want to be. Um, I think that anywhere where you're valued and where you know, your opinion matters and you make a difference mm -hmm. is, is great. I think the younger me was different. You know, I've sort of, I'm always working on myself, but I'm sort of trying to be more of a in the moment person and not worry about the future yeah. in, in a way that you know, is jealous or has any sort of negative animosity towards someone else that has a job or whatever that, oh man, I want that job. Or why did that guy get jet? He got it because he got it. It doesn't matter. You have a great job. Mm -hmm. You're in a great place. You're valued. You you love your athletes. It's it's great, you know? Ultimately, if as a coach, if you live in the moment and you do what you're supposed to do, and you do your job and you do it to the best of your ability, all the fruits of your labor will eventually come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, you and I have talked about hypotheticals before and different things and it, it's all irrelevant because ultimately you have to do a great job with where you're at, you know, and that, that's a, you know, it's a trendy thing that people wrote about in books, but ultimately it, it, it's true. Yeah. You know, it's true. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I hope you get that opportunity someday because I think you'd be amazing. And my and, wife would uh, kill me. I think I she, yeah, she'd kill be me tough. <laughs> be tough. <laughs> Cause she knows I'd be like 24 <laughs> seven all yeah. in like see yeah. you when I'm done, yeah. you know, and that would be, it, an issue. It is take you know take what I asked about you out of it. It is an interesting trend that we talked about, or something that we think we're going to see. Like, it just makes so much sense because really, you mentioned that you know the special teams coordinator, the head coach, and the strength coach addressing the team. The reality is, the strength coach addresses the team more than they ever do. You know, every single day, and is right. really the the key motivator of that entire program. Really, the strength coach sets the culture of the program. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a good strength coach, it, like if things are lackadaisical in the, in the weight room, it's gonna be lackadaisical in the field. If there's no discipline in one place, um, it, it, it won't be any discipline on the field. So it is, and and two, when it comes to be like taking over the head coaching role, you know, a position coach who gets a head coaching job also has things they, they haven't they haven't addressed the whole team. They haven't let an organization, whereas a strength coach, you really have. So it is an interesting thing, and I, I agree. I think some AD at some point is going to take that chance and try to be the the AD that 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 started that trend. I, I think you're right. I really do, and I think it's it's definitely possible, and I think it would work out in their favor. I really do because yeah. you're right. I you know. With the exception of a long tenured head coach, nobody has the experience of guiding 115 to 140 yeah. young men on a daily basis, essentially 11 months of the year mm -hmm. than, a, than a strength coach, sport, sports yeah. performance coach. And, you, and you really, the strength coach, I feel like, really gets to know the personalities of the players better than coaches, than, than position coaches or head coaches a lot because even like when a new player comes into the team, what, what are the coaches always doing? Going to the strength coach. How is he? What's he act like? What's his personality like? Was he early? You know, you get to find out all this stuff about the player. You get to see how they interact with their teammates. Mm -hmm. Like do players like them? Do they not like them? Do, do, do other players get excited for them? Um, you get a really cool perspective on it. Yeah. I, I, I've thought a lot about the nuances of that. It would be, it would be interesting because I would still want to do, what I do. Yeah. And because of just what you said, mm -hmm. I find out right away yeah. what makes everybody tick, mm -hmm. how they handle adversity, what kind of mover are they? Mm -hmm. What's their personality like? Are they, you know, are they vocal? Are they not? Are they uh, a personable with their team? All those things, it would be really hard for one person to kind of be able to do all that. Mm -hmm. And, in particular at the the level I'm at now. Yeah. But it's possible. Yeah. You know, it's possible. And then obviously the other hurdle is X's and O's. Yeah. But that's why you have an offensive and well, defensive most, coordinator. Most head coaches aren't, aren't. I mean, unless you're like an OC, but a lot of head coaches that we know and we've talked about it aren't big X's and O's guys, you know. <laughs> there's there the yeah, I mean, it's listen, that, there, yeah. there's there's a lot that are involved and there's a lot that aren't involved. Yeah. You know, you have the CEO model, right? The CEO head coach, that there's plenty of them around yeah. the country. You know, I was lucky enough to work for Steve Spurrier who called the plays, yeah. which was relatively normal in his era mm -hmm. and now is becoming less common, yeah. less common. You know, I mean, can you name a head coach that calls plays? Gus Malzahn, yeah. right? G give me another one that yeah. actually calls the plays on offense and defense, maybe Josh Heupel. Yeah, maybe I don't know. Heupel calls on offense. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it's it's point. it's relatively rare. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting dynamic, but being a head coach, man, there's it's re it's really hard. I I I think that um, people that can manage their time and and manage their message. That's got to be the hardest part, you know, because there's so many people that you're overseeing, you're in charge of, that 
that want your attention outside of the program, all the people inside of the program, the fundraising, the the administrative things. That's terrible. The uh, <laughs> and you know that is not me. Yeah, I was gonna say. You know, that. like yeah. everyone they'd probably hate me. Yeah. You know, because I don't I don't I'm not great at like kissing people's ass. I just yeah. can't. You know what I mean? So it's probably never going to happen, Adam, <laughs> but um, you can always dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't be able to be just BS someone and be like, yeah, if you hate them, you ain't going to sit there. And, be and, like, and again, too, like the recruiting piece, that's, that's yeah. hard. You know, tell the kid he's soft to his face. Dude, you're not very good. <laughs> I mean, I've, you know, I've definitely uh, wrote off a recruit just based on, you know, him coming in and interacting yeah, we, with me and listening. And that, that is, that is like go going back to like how you, how you see all hundred some players every single day. Like you have a amazing ability to read people very quickly. And I, I know there's been many times where you've said to me, like this guy's, he's, he ain't going to make it. Or like this guy's going to be a freak. And I'm like, he's not very good. You're like, no, no, no. I'm telling you, he's going to be an all American. You know, and like, and you've been right many times on both ends, whether it's recruits, whether it's high school kids, whether it's guys on the team, um, whether it's even when we were at UMass, you would tell me guys that came in, like this freshman is going to be unreal. And I was like, I don't think he's very good. And then he ends up being, you know, getting drafted. Right. So do you, do you feel like you get that, you, you, you get that from, from being around the guys so much? I think it's a demographic too. Yeah. I think, you know, the 16, 17 year old to 22 or 23, yeah. there's a huge huge difference in that age right i mean think about when you were 16 to when you were 23 like yeah. there's a there's a big difference so a lot of growth can occur i see you know i see the nuances of people's personality usually right away in the way they present themselves yeah. in their eye contact and how they how they speak they do speak if they don't speak mm -hmm. you know how do you get them in a comfortable situation so you can really pull out even more and understand you know, what makes this person tick or what doesn't, what do they like? What do they not like? Um, how do they like to be coached? Yeah. You know, you go around the country and everywhere you go, everybody's like, Oh, everybody's the same. No, they're not. Yeah. Kids from California are different than kids from Florida that are different from kids from Massachusetts that are different yeah. from kids from, you know, Kentucky. Yeah. Young men are different based on their experiences and the way they were raised and them, the, 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 geography of that it yeah. does matter because yeah. everywhere is a little different yeah. you know well i appreciate all your time man and i I'm, I'm glad i think a lot of people will get a lot out of this and learning things to optimize their own performance but also kind of the behind the scenes of you know college football and what you do every single day and, and i'm glad people get to know you too so appreciate your time thank you again for everything you've done for me and, and i'm glad we're finally able to get you on the on the podcast man no man i'm i'm Super fortunate and grateful to to be able to do what I do and super fortunate to be able to spend some time with one of my guys, Appreciate you know, yeah. you, uh, you've always been, uh, not only, a, a, an athlete, but a friend. And I think that, um, that's, uh, that's important. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. Sounds good. Thank you.